He has gone viral for debates with the likes of Jordan Peterson and Ben Shapiro and Candace Owens, Pierce Morgan and Tommy Lahren. And he is joining us today here on The Will Cain Show. So let's get started with story number one. <laughs> Stephen Bunnell II, otherwise known as Destiny, uh, is joining us now on The Will Cain Show. There's already a comment from someone named Pembroke here asking or saying, oh my God, Destiny at Fox News. That was not on my apocalypse bingo card. So Destiny, welcome to Fox News. Hey, thanks for having me. How does it feel to be in the belly of the beast? You made it all the way to New York City, and you walked into 1211 Avenue of the Americas. You made it to the 15th floor, and you're sitting in a studio at Fox. Feels amazing, you know? Just waiting to uh, work my way up to... Uh... <laughs> what? <laughs> Never mind. Uh, I'm excited to be here. It's fun to be here, yeah. <laughs> you know, work your way up to what? To, to Hannity? To yeah, work the your bigger, way up to Newsmax? Uh, what, what do you want to comment? say? <laughs> I was going to say to Sean Hannity, but and I, I don't even know who works here anymore, because I know Bill O'Reilly isn't here and everything, and I don't watch cable news much anymore, so yeah, I'm not sure. But yeah, whoever is whoever is still well. Listen, here. I don't know. How, I don't know where this is going to go, and that's fine. I'm, I'm happy to see exactly where our conversation goes today. We'll talk about some of the news of the day. We'll talk about Donald Trump's trial in New York City. But let me just start with this, man. Um, tell me, tell me a, about yourself. Like you have really risen. I think it would be unfair to say over the past couple of months, because over a decade now, you've been successful streaming on various platforms. So, you know, um, what is it about you that is so willing and interested in talking to people like me, that you're willing to engage and debate, where so much of the attitude on the left is you shouldn't platform people that disagree with you. You shouldn't debate because it gives credence to opinions that I would assume, at least in some cases, you and I will have very big disagreement and you may even find abhorrent. So why are you so interested in debate? I think there's three big reasons. I think the first one is that I grew up very conservative, and I come from like a debater-type family. My mom is Cuban, and that whole half of my family are very much into shouting matches and screaming at each other. And afterwards, we're always cool, but that's just always been that kind of household orientation. Uh, and then growing up conservative has kind of given me a lot of insight into a, what a lot of conservative people think. Um, it's not like, you know, they just hate ordinary people or, you know, they hate women because of abortion or they hate uh, black people because of opposition to BLM or whatever. It, it lets me understand the opposing view a little bit more so I can counter it better. Uh, second reason is because I came up in a very kind of brutal online era where the people online were incredibly mean to each other. So that kind of gave me the ability to talk to people in a very kind of rough way. And I would say around 2016 on the internet, most of the online political conversation was either uh, like Ben Shapiro, facts don't care about your feelings types, um, or like very soft people on the left who didn't want to have adversarial conversations. Uh, so I, I had a, an advantage there. And then the third thing is I have a really strong commitment, I think, to a lot of the core democratic, like liberal, like liberalism ideas of freedom of speech and debate and marketplace of ideas and all that. So, Well, let's start with number three. I believe you that you have um, a very strong commitment to free speech, and that being a, not just a fundamental principle of the left, but when one would hope and one would think a fundamental principle of America. But it is, a, it is one that seems to have been betrayed on the left. I mean, there's been an open embrace of censorship. Um, and as we just talked about, even as at a more abstract level, just an unwillingness to hear from points of view that you disagree with, um, much less interact with them. What do you think's happened to the left when it comes to free speech? I think that anytime somebody gets a lot of power in an area, freedom of speech becomes one of those things that can be used to challenge them. So they kind of don't like it. Um, I think that freedom of speech is a thing that you have to protect for the unpopular side, obviously, because the popular side doesn't need those protections. People are going to challenge it anyway. So whether we're talking the left and kind of the hold that they have on a lot of culture or whether we're talking about Donald Trump when he's the president and he wants to, you know, sue media because he doesn't like what they say about him. Um, I think that whenever people have a lot of power in a particular area, freedom of speech becomes a very threatening concept to them and that power. So they kind of want to stifle it as much as possible. I, I totally agree. I, I don't I don't think that any either side ideologically has shown a historical consistency to the principle of free speech. It just so happens to be that the left controls almost all the mechanisms of power, certainly behind the scenes. And with that comes the protection of censorship. I would draw a distinction between Donald Trump suggesting he would sue the media in the case of defamation. It's probably impossible for Donald Trump to prove a defamation case. I mean, he's such a public figure. 
But I would think he'd have a legitimate claim in many, many cases about openly malicious and false statements towards him. I would distinguish that from, you know, the government looking to impose upon private companies censorship when it comes to COVID or a quote unquote election denial or whatever it may be. Those are two different approaches to censorship. Yeah, I agree. But I'm not aware of any time the government imposed on uh, social media that they, they said they had to censor something. I think a lot of social media companies, I think in good faith, are trying to figure out how to navigate certain uh, information environments, we'll say, where there's a lot of conflicting information coming out uh, from a lot of different sources and people are trying to figure out what is their responsibility to society, what are the ways that they can conduct themselves to keep people safe and healthy while still respecting you know, like user-generated content and everything else. So I, I think COVID was genuinely a very challenging time for people figuring out what it is they wanted to support or what they believed in or the types of values they should uphold and then how that was competing against things like concerns over public health and whatnot. But you don't think, Destiny, for example, what was revealed for, from guys like Matt Taibbi in the Twitter files, that the government leaning through the FBI and other mechanisms, leaning heavily on social media companies, Twitter for one, but we can already also know that it was Facebook and others, to take down content. You don't think that crosses a First Amendment barrier of the government interfering with free speech? Um, from what I saw, no. I highly encourage people to read the Twitter files if they actually think that, but I didn't see anything like that. Um, there were times when the FBI, uh, um, Twitter was working a lot with the FBI, for instance, uh, in saying, oh, do you think there are spam accounts? Or do you think there are bad accounts? But there were times when the FBI was submitting, what, like over 100,000 accounts that they had flagged as being malicious or bots or Chinese or whatever. And I don't think Twitter banned any of them. So it didn't seem like if Twitter didn't comply with the FBI, it didn't seem like it was a whole bunch of pressure there. It was more just the FBI saying like, hey, this might be a thing. Check it out. And when it came to... Uh, like, for instance, that I think it was the New York Post, right, that had that story about Hunter Biden. Like, we got all the leaks from Twitter, from the emails where they were debating internally, you know, how do we handle the story? What should we do with it? And none of that was like, we need to do this because the FBI is coming after us. It seemed like genuinely a lot of employees that were really trying to figure out what the right thing to do was. Yeah, but that's the soft power of government. If I mean, if a cop comes to your house and says, hey, you really should start behaving in X, Y, Z manner – you know, it doesn't really matter what the law says. The implication is the power of the cops can modify, will modify your behavior. And while the FBI wasn't perhaps saying directly take this down, their suggestions, their their suggestion came with an implication of power behind the scenes. As Congress, for example, or the DOJ, as part of Congress, looked at different ways to begin to regulate social media. Facebook runs in fear of regulation from the government. I mean, like, there's soft power everywhere. You can get into, you can have a discussion about that, but if that's the case, I mean, what what harder soft power than the president implying he should that the media is the enemy of the people and he should be able to open defamation suits that they're publishing stuff about him that he finds defamatory? I mean, we're going to talk about soft power. Considering the FBI never took any legal action or anything or official action against any of these social media companies for not banning suggested accounts, I would argue that the soft power of the president of the United States declaring the media an enemy of the people and then threatening to open up defamation lawsuits against them or threatening to suspend the Constitution to, to search for voter fraud and stuff like that, I think those are far more scary breaches of norms and, and utilization of soft power to have like a chilling effect on public discourse. What do you, I mean, you yourself, weren't you banned from Twitch for having conversations? And I understand it's a private company. Now mm -hmm. we're, we're moving beyond governmental influence into just the cultural embrace of the idea of free speech. You, which by the way, is a huge part of America. It's not just that it's guaranteed by the government, but that we as a culture have generally understood the marketplace of ideas is what's healthy for a society. You yourself were censored, I think, kicked off of Twitch. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I disagree, obviously, but they're a private company. They have the right to do it. Yeah. But uh, you think it's a problem? I mean, I, I, I saw conflicting reports on why you were kicked off. Was it because you hosted Nick Fuentes? Because you said something about I think trans it, I athletes? Think it had I don't to know do, why you were kicked off. It was a lot of debates with, with trans people at the time. Um, there are multiple ways in which you could talk about freedom of speech, I, and I'm glad at least you pointed out there's a difference between like the, um, you know, the First Amendment restricting the government from creating laws or bridging your right to freedom of speech. But there's also private companies and how they approach freedom of speech too. I think that private companies should be relatively open to a lot of different ideas, you know, within whatever they feel is appropriate for their platform. I guess Twitch feels like the type of speech that I embody is not appropriate for their platform, so they decided to <laughs> go in a way that doesn't include me. Obviously, I disagree with that. I disagree with that pretty heavily, but. I mean, that's a that's a fight that you have on either the personal, uh, professional, or cultural level, which is a is a whole different beast than the government level. 
I'm curious. I'm just going to follow my curiosity um, because I don't know anything about this. Mm -hmm. um, I, I said you are extremely successful on YouTube. You were extremely successful on Twitch. Was that a huge financial setback for you to be banned from Twitch? Um, yeah, it was pretty significant, yeah. But I've always kind of diversified my uh, revenue streams because I know that depending on the topics you talk about, uh, you can get into hot water. So I don't like to restrict what I'm saying or restrict the topics that I approach just because of who's paying me money. So I always make sure to kind of have my fingers and everything or to have different revenue streams set up so that if I lose one, I'm not completely out of commission. And you're killing it, right? You, you, I, mean, I assume you were as well killing it on Twitch. Yeah. I mean, I'm asking that out of curiosity because I don't know what the streamer economy seems to be something that is, you know, probably for the 1% and you were in, you were and probably still are in the 1% of streamers. But I mean, we're talking about serious money, a serious business streaming. Yeah. I'd say 0.1%. Yeah. Um, no, yeah, I, I do very, very well. I'm very successful. I'm very, I'm very lucky. I'm very happy. Uh, you know, I'm grateful for my fan base. I'm grateful that I grew up in a country that allowed me to have these conversations and pursue, you know, all the things that I did. And I, arguably, only in the United States could all the opportunity that I've had exist here. So, yeah, I'm I'm super happy about how my life has turned out so far. Yeah. So, what do you? That's a good place. To, so, you know, you say you, you you grew up on the right in a conservative household. Um, you know, I think one of the most fundamental philosophical debates right now that divides the left and the right, once we get beyond sort of the news of the day and the, and the important but, but specific disagreements we have, I think that at least on the right, and I'll share with you this point of view, which you say you probably already know, one of the divides seems to come down to the very nature of the United States. You just spent some time praising the United States, but there is at least a big sentiment on the right that the left has fallen out of love with America. They just don't love whatever is essential about America that has made it a unique experiment on, on the world stage. Um, I already see you kind of rolling your head back and forth. Um, you disagree with that? You don't think you think the left still loves the idea of America? Uh, absolutely not. I, I agree with you that there's a huge problem on the left with not having love for this country, with only looking at the negative aspects of it, and I think it's incredibly sad. But uh, unfortunately, because there, there are different things I could look to the left for, and there are different things I could look to the right for, and be like, listen, you know, we're all kind of crazy, but there are some things I could rely on some sides for. And, you know, the left obviously has no love for, uh, you know, country, military, anything like that, but the right has a respect for had respect for things like rule of law or had respect for, you know, like the integrity or honor of our country and some of our large businesses. Uh, you know, I could rely on the neocons at least for that. And it feels like, unfortunately, that kind of like populist undercurrent has swept away a lot of what I thought used to be kind of admirable from the right. Uh, for instance, uh, I know these are going to be really prickly topics, but I personally, okay, I'm on the left. I'm a huge proponent of capitalism. I'm a huge proponent of globalism. I think that the vaccines that the United States spearheaded is like the ultimate example of the uh, the union of government. It was Donald Trump and his warp speed program that pushed that as quickly as possible. It was capitalism. It was U.S. business and innovation that manufactured stuff uh, or did the research and development. And it was um, it was globalism. It was us working with BioNTech in Germany. It was uh, manufacturing those nanolipid par particles, I think, in, oh, I might have been in Norway um, or Denmark. Like, all of this was a really cool thing, I think, that came together with a lot of different forces. But uh, because of how politicized everything is today, it, it, the right won't even take credit for when America does something well. Um, and then obviously the left won't take credit for a lot of things the United States does well. I think I personally don't like Elon Musk or his politics uh, a lot. I really don't like his politics. But man, the rocket stuff, it was really cool. SpaceX is really awesome. Watching the things come back to Earth is, is sick. And, you know, regardless of if you think Teslas are not the best car or not the best build quality or have, uh, you know, Q&A problems or whatever, um, the uh, the the Tesla cars probably pushed forward electronic vehicles by like ten or fifteen years at least. I don't think anybody denies that. So yeah, I, I don't like that the politicization politicization of every single topic has made it so it seems like neither side right now is willing to acknowledge anything good about the country. Okay, well you know I saw a video of you saying that you fall into the trap of destruction a lot, and I can sympathize with that. Um, meaning you can tear down someone else's argument. Um, I can sympathize with that. I spent a lot of years, Destiny, on ESPN, and um, I remember there's this this commentator. He's a play-by-play -play guy. His name is Joe Des Tessitore, and he has this really distinct delivery and voice. He said, Kane, you are a counterpuncher. And I'd go against Stephen A. Smith, and I'd hear his argument, and it would be very easy for me to, d humbly but accurately, it would be very easy for me to destroy Stephen A. Smith's argument. But that's different than making a positive um, argument that is looking for a, a solution, or just one that is one that forwards a case without looking to tear down someone else's. Um, so, 
I want to do this. You said a lot in that answer. You talked about the populist right. You talked about the vaccines. You talked about the private industry. Um, and you talked about the left. I want to see if we can dig into all of those. Let's start with the left. So you said why the left, you said the left does have this underlying, I don't know, lack of love for America. Let's talk about why for a minute. To me, it's like, um, you know, a woman who always says that she loves you, but she fundamentally wants to change who you are. At some point, it's like, well, do you really love me? If everything about me you want to change, what is it about me that you love? That's what I think often about the left. They have this utopic vision of the future that totally distances itself from what made America as an experiment unique. It sees America as racist, as flawed, as bigoted in every fashion, as misogynistic. And because of that, I think, the left looks constantly across waters to Europe or someplace else as some better model with, I think, very little firsthand experience or even academic understanding of what works or doesn't work in those countries. That would be my diagnosis of why the left doesn't love America. Why do you think it doesn't love America? I think that people in general have a very hard time seeing shades of gray, and this applies to all aspects of life, not just politics. It could apply to personal relationships or, or you know, work colleagues or whatever. And I think that America has a history that you know has problems and issues and things that we've done poorly, things that we've done horribly, uh, whether we're talking foreign intervention, whether we're talking domestic policy, obviously things like slavery, falling into things like Jim Crow. Um, and I think that when you look at the messy history of the United States and really of every single country on the planet, uh, it's easy to look at the bad things and think that because of those bad things, everything is bad. And I feel like the left falls into that trap a lot where when you look at the past and you see issues or problems in the past, it's hard to give credit for the things that are good and you only fixate on the things that are bad. And then going forward, it, it people do this weird mind trick where they start linking together too many what should be discrete ideas of like, oh, America's a good country, and they hear, oh, America did nothing wrong. Like, that's what people hear when you say that. So um, I, I just think there's this, right. yeah, it's this yeah, fallacious tendency to link everything together, and, and you can't accept that, like, oh, we have a really awesome country, and we've also made some big mistakes in the past, but we've moved on from them, which is, like, really cool, and we continue to grow and learn, yeah. Also, by the way, that we've made mistakes in the past, and everyone acknowledges what those are, but we still remain the most successful experiment in a mass civilization in human history. I find this very similar to the racism debate. So, you know, if you take any singular particular case, I don't know, we could talk about Michael Brown or whichever one, and you start pushing back on the facts of that individual case. Well, this doesn't add up, you know, hands up, don't shoot, witness testimonies, that didn't happen. Before you know it, you're running at 100 miles an hour, and somebody says, oh, you don't think racism exists. And I didn't say that. But if I push back on the specificities of one particular incident, you extrapolated it into this entire thing about what I believe about America. And I think that the left has done that. They've extrapolated out our sins into a, an indictment of the core of the country. And by the way, with that, not understanding kind of what I think you hinted at, every country, every experiment in hum human civilization has dealt with tribalism, racism, and quite honestly, slavery. Every single one. There is no perfect society that managed to escape that. That I don't know if it's I don't know if it's instinctual. Um, I don't know if it's an instinctual, you know, habit that humans have gone to at various times. But every single civilization has portrayed those mistakes and those weaknesses. So did America. The question isn't what defines us as our mistakes. But what makes us unique on the good? And I think that evidence is just overwhelming. I, yeah, I would agree with that, although I think the problem we run into now is people aren't really sure. Like you brought up earlier um, that, that people on the left don't know what made this country great. I'm not sure at the moment if anybody knows what made this country great. It feels like everything has become so political and people are living in completely different factual realities now. You know, you bring up the Michael Brown case. There are a lot of those BLM cases where when you start to dig into the facts a little bit more, you're like, mm, this is a lot – there's a lot less um, a sure thing than I was originally led to believe. But I would argue that similar stuff happens with, say, like the Trump indictments, where people have a very strong opinion about a thing, and then when you ask them questions about, like, well, do you know anything about, like, the electorate slates? Or do you know anything about, you know, um, any of the particular facts of the case? People are like, well, I didn't hear about that, or I don't believe that. Or even if you're telling me that, and it is reported, uh, you know, the indictments are rigged and corrupt and the DOJ is rigged and corrupt. And I don't believe any of that except for when they indict Hunter Biden. I believe that. But when they indict Trump, that's not real. And when they investigated Trump and Mar-a-Lago, that's not real. But when they investigated Joe Biden, that was real. And I don't like 
everybody is so the, the epistemic, the, the truth factor has become uh, like inextricably tr tied to your political positions such that people are only willing to accept political truths that uh, or, or fundamental truths that like jive with their political opinion. And I think that's a huge problem with the left and right now. We live in totally separate realities. OK, by the way. I don't disagree with that. We live in totally separate realities. It's like we're watching the same movie screen but seeing two different movies. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to forget, and I am going to come back to your challenge of the populist right mm -hmm. and your your praise of the vaccine, but I'm going to stay here for a moment because sure. you kind of opened the door to some specificities. Let's do this for a moment. Let's talk about the most recent specificity, and that's Donald Trump in New York. So first of all, let's start broadly. Do you not believe that there is a form of lawfare taking place against Donald Trump? Um, I wish you had the conversation in six months. Of, of the four cases against Donald Trump, I don't like the New York one. I think the other three are pretty strong, the two federal ones for sure, and the Georgia one I think has a lot of merit. Uh, the New York one is, is what it is. I don't think it's the worst case of the world. Um, I think that if it was against Biden, I think that if Biden was uh, using his money during an election season to pay off uh, somebody to – you know, sensibly benefit him in the election. I think that conservatives are making a really big deal about it. But um, yeah, I don't have like strong. Well, but the yeah. question isn't mm -hmm. the question isn't what conservatives would say on the internet. The question is whether or not the Department of Justice or the legal system, in this case, the Manhattan District Attorney, would pursue the charges. And we we have one on one comparison. It's not Biden. It's John Edwards, who was a Democrat who had an affair, who paid off the affair. Um, the Federal Elections Commission um, and the Department of Justice looked into it and said. No, it's not there. It's not a strong case. In fact, no, they did pursue it, and they got poured out. They, it was immediately dismissed, which led, in this case, the DOJ and the Federal Elections Commission to look at this case with Donald Trump and go, they can't, we can't win this. This is weak. And they passed. It took a politicized DA in a politicized, um, in a politicized jurisdiction, meaning the electorate there that will make up the jury, it took that to bring what was, what is it? misdemeanor charges that have passed the statute of limitations, charge him up to felonies and try to get something, which he may get. He may get a very left jury to end up with the result of convicted felon Donald Trump. But that doesn't mean the case is good. It'll be one on appeal. And that leads everybody to go with specificity to your point, understanding the facts to go. This is nothing but political. It's nothing but lawfare to affect an election. I mean, I wouldn't say it's nothing but political. Uh, the federal government passing on some charges that a state decides to go after isn't the most surprising thing in the world. Federal cases tend to be airtight. They have, what is it, isn't it like a 97% conviction rate on charges that they bring uh, forth to people. So it's not surprising that a state might be more willing to explore something that a federal government might not. Um, also, in terms of turning the state charges, uh, the misdemeanors into felonies, I mean, there is a legal process by which they do that, and that's if the misdemeanor was done in the commission of another crime, which here... I think had to do with election. What crime was it? Uh, like my understanding, I don't not want, this is the only case that I study in depth, but my understanding is that um, the uh, co-mingling or, or the utilization of like um, a campaign, like a campaign donation that doesn't get reported properly, that that's essentially what the Cohen payment was. And if the bookkeeping error was done, ordinarily it would be a misdemeanor crime, which are correct, the statute of limitations would have passed. But if that bookkeeping error was done in order to hide a campaign donation that went unreported, then the bookkeeping error would have been done to the commission of that crime, which makes the bookkeeping crime a felony, which is how they got the upgrade. Well, this is where now. I have to outsource. Sure. This is where I have to outsource some of my facts. I mean, Jonathan Turley, who was on this show, on the Will Cain show yesterday, um, said that it was reported within the next quarter. And by the way, the you know, you talked about the feds and the state choosing different things. Well, that's usually driven by jurisdiction. It's not the jurisdiction of a Manhattan district attorney to to look into federal election law crimes, especially when the Federal Election Commission has looked into it and said no. And in fact, Bragg hasn't even specified. You and I are talking about it, and people are saying is that what he's looking for as far as a federal election crime? But he hasn't well specified what it is. He hasn't said what the felony charge would be. Um, yeah, well, I guess we'll find. I guess we'll find out when it comes. This is the only indictment I didn't read. I hate that this is the one of the four. Uh, like I said before, I don't like this case personally. I don't think. I think the Mar-a-Lago one is very strong. I think the uh, other federal Jack Smith's case, the big federal one, is big, and I think the Georgia one has already turned out. I, I think good. Um, convictions, plea deals, essentially already. But I, yeah, I don't know. The New York one, I'm not fully sold on. But I don't know. Maybe as the trial commences, maybe we I find totally other respect. Stuff, yeah. mm -hmm. I, I respect when someone says I'm not fully read in on this particular one. But I think the takeaway, Destiny, is if this one is so weak, it's just such a good illustration 
that what is being done here is not a true pursuit of the just of justice. And by the way, most people think the Mar-a-Lago case is the strongest, but even then, not the strongest case in the world. Um, the Jack Smith case, as we speak right now, the Supreme Court is hearing arguments on January 6th defendants on the obstruction of justice law and whether or not it applies to people rioting at the Capitol. But the point is, what the Manhattan case illustrates is, none of these are pursuit of the justice. Of justice, They're all a pursuit to try to um, tar Donald Trump before an election, because polls suggest if you can say Donald Trump convicted felon, you might swing some independent voters. Could it not be that they think that he committed legitimate wrongs as well? I, I can understand that I've it's seen hard you tweet to separate. This. What? Well, no, I've seen you tweet this. You've said, look, it could be that one guy broke the law more mm-hmm. than the other guy. Yeah. It could, like, it could that be also that they... requires us. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, it could be that there is a strong feeling from Braggs that he really does feel like Trump committed a, a grave error here, that, you know, you did lie about your bookkeeping stuff and you did do it in order to influence this election. And that's a big deal. Um, I, I mean, whether or not that's, that's lawful, a huge benefit of the doubt. It is. But I mean, I think it, <laughs> I mean, here, here's the here's the thing. Republicans historically have always been strong defenders of uh, right to own and bear firearms and big proponents of the Second Amendment. I enjoy it, the Second Amendment a lot. I just got a sick new pistol two days ago. Uh, I really like shooting guns. However, man, Hunter Biden uh, catching. What was it? That was in a that was a conviction for lying on a what, like lying on a forty four seventy three because there's a video of him doing drugs and owning a gun at the same time. I don't know if there's ever been mm-hmm. a federal charge like that in the history of all of uh, going through forty four seventy threes in my entire life. But nobody seems to care about that because it's Hunter Biden, even though it's like a gun thing. So, I, I mean, I I, ha- I I try to give people the benefit of the doubt unless they've shown me a lot of reason why uh, I, I shouldn't give them the benefit of the doubt. And I will agree that in New York, Braggs has said things in the past where it's like, man, you really should shut up. You really shouldn't be saying, you know, these types of politically charged statements about wanting to go after Trump or whatever publicly. Um, yeah, I'm not going to I'm not going to die on the hill of defending that New York case. But I do try to give the benefit of the doubt where it's possible. And it could just be that he really does feel like something wrong has happened here. And if he hasn't and you know what, if it's BS, I hope that Trump wins in court. I hope he beats it. Okay, you, let's put a pin in this because I think uh-huh. it comes back to something else I want to talk to you about at a broader level. Because my contention is it's a symptom of a DOJ that has been politicized against a single man, or for better yet, I mean, even broader, I think, against a certain ideology. Well, it can't be that, um, right? Because the we'll, DOJ we'll, said they wouldn't do anything here, right? This is New York State, right? For this case. Yeah, fair mm-hmm. point. The others, um, the Mar a Lago case and Jack Smith case, DOJ. But you brought up Hunter Biden, and those were DOJ related cases. Mm-hmm. But the, how about the justice system at large? But uh, once we get down to the state case, then it's going to be different justice systems in different states. Mm-hmm. Um, and I respect and appreciate that. But uh, let's, and we'll come back to this. Um, the populist right, this is where we're going to tie this in for a minute. Mm-hmm. You don't like it. And you did tweet, or you said something like, I miss neocons, <laughs> which is kind of a weird thing to hear like 10 years removed from the left. Mm -hmm. I mean, Destiny, I actually, I I appreciate the pivot in the movement of Republicans over the past 10 years towards populism, less elitism, more in touch with the electorate, more concerned with the middle class, um, more concerned, I think, not just in rhetoric, but the everyman out there, the person who's getting censored on the internet in every way and less interested in your, your appreciation of the globalism, of of, you know, I don't know, blurring lines and borders across this world. Um, I I just think that what we've seen is a a healthier, better Republican Party under the banner of of populism. There's no way you could think that. It can't possibly be true. I feel like there are... (laughs) I do. There are so many fundamental things about the conservatives in the 2000s that I thought were defensible and maybe even good. Like, one of those was a supposed to be like a reverence for rule of law, like doing things that were legal, having, that was always one of the biggest defenses of our border was like, listen, if you're gonna come here, you should come here legally. It's important that people follow laws. And I feel like after January 6th, I remember before January 6th, the idea would be that if you saw people on camera fighting with cops, those are always leftists. They're always, they're BLM people, they're the crazy progressives, they're whatever, like that was what was that was supposed to be. It was always supposed to be crazy people on the left. But um, man, past January 6th and looking at how conservatives talked about the cops in the Uvalde, the Texas shooting, and then the general huge disdain they have now for all of our intelligence agencies because apparently the whole government is poised against them. Uh, I don't know, it's really sad. Like it feels like the respect for any sort of institution or rule of law is like completely out the window. 
Um, you've got this, this, nobody wants to give credit to any of our large businesses anymore, uh, which for all their faults, like Facebook and Amazon, like it's cool. And, and Tesla and SpaceX, it's cool that America is the place where people come to make these huge businesses. It's awesome that these places are, yeah, you can always cut me off too. I can ramble forever, but. Um, no, no, I'm not. I'm yeah. not going to cut you off. Yeah. I, no. Yeah. I, or I, I, when I say um, cut me off, I mean, if I say you're saying you're good, so yeah. much. Yeah. You're saying yeah, go so for, yeah, much that I want to respond to in one answer. No. Okay. Don't intermingle rule of law and respect for institutions. Those okay. are two separate conversations. And for that matter, big business is a third wing of this. Mm -hmm. We'll stick with rule of law from it. I don't see can Republicans I ask you, have distanced themselves. At the end of this question also, can you tell me what is yeah. something that you think the populist right likes about America right now? Not like they liked where we were, like right. Yeah, but as you answer this, I'm curious, like what do you think the populist right loves about America or or respects about America right now? I'm curious. Yeah, go for it. Uh, I'll answer your question. I think mm -hmm. the populist right loves the spiritual culture of what it means to be an American and doesn't commingle or confuse that with the institutions of America. I think the populist right understands that America is not a sitting body of representatives in Washington, D.C., but it's the small town businesses on the main square in Sherman, Texas, or it is the people in church or the people in communities in people in charity giving back or the, the entrepreneur that built this country, the risk taker. I think the populist right understands Americans, but doesn't confuse that with the government being America. And now that I've answered your question, let me put some of what you said back to you. Mm -hmm. Rule of law. I don't think the right has distanced itself from the rule of law. I think what it asks for is equal application of the law. And that's why we talk about Trump. And that's why Hunter Biden comes in or Joe Biden comes in. It's in. You're right. There are perhaps more questions about about cops on individualized basis because you brought up Uvalde. But the real questions are about the ap equal application of law from institutions like the FBI, the CIA and the Department of Justice. Can I ask, um, you brought up before for the spirit of America, and I'm curious, Scalia once gave, uh, I don't know if it was testimony, or for some reason he was talking to a panel in front of Congress, and it was a speech about a parchment guarantee. Have you ever heard this before? Are you familiar with what I'm talking about? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So uh, for people listening, I guess, Scalia basically talked about how uh, the United States Constitution doesn't really provide for more freedoms than other constitutions. That if you looked, I think, for the documents relating to the founding of the Soviet Union, they had way more in the Soviet Union's uh, documents. Uh, I, don't, I don't think it was called a constitution. I wish I remember the words. But they had way more rights that were uh, both positively and negatively guaranteed to Soviet Union citizens than what you could find in the Constitution. Mm -hmm. But then Scalia would talk about, however, in the Soviet Union, that didn't matter. The institutions didn't exist to guard those rights. The environment didn't exist to grant grant um, whatever positive or negative freedoms you, you wish mm -hmm. you had as a citizen, that he called these parchment guarantees. And right. I agree with what you say that in the United States, we're awesome because of our entrepreneurs. We're awesome because of a, of a whole bunch of different things that make America a unique place. But I think that part of what allows this to happen are the institutions that we have. Uh, the idea that I can start a business and I can sell food to people and I know the food is probably going to be safe. We have an FDA that regulates that, that I have the right to start a business and sell goods and services to people across state lines because the federal government says that everybody has to use the same currency. I don't have to worry about any weird interstate crossing the borders or doing anything. I know that if I do business internationally, there's a coherent like federal government that negotiates in terms of like trade uh, and tariffs and everything, and they you know unilaterally can do that. I know that there's a lot of things that the federal government provides and ensures American citizens that allow us to thrive in the way that we do. As much as I love America, I don't believe believe that American stock is like inherently genetically better than any other stock around the world. However, I think that the combination of all the people that come here to pursue what we have, combined with our institutions that safeguard and allow for that flourishing, I think it's that unique combination of things that have allowed Americans to flourish. And I don't think we could have gotten as far as we could have without our institutions. Yeah. Okay, uh, just to be clear, and I, mm -hmm. this is a great conversation. I'm going to address every point mm -hmm. that you made. Um, you know, I didn't make the argument for an inherently superior genetic stock. You oh, yeah, no, I'm sorry. The, I, when I, when I brought that up, I, I wasn't meaning to imply it. I'm just saying that, like, I don't think Americans are intrinsically better than anyone else. I think it's a combination of both uh, the people here and the Well, but you understand yeah. the existence. Um, you understand the existence and the unequal value of various cultures. So one culture can be superior to another culture. Yeah, of course. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so my argument mm -hmm. is the American culture, and it's not it's not a recent phenomenon. I think it is part of the whole the whole identity of America that it was founded by essentially that pioneer frontier spirit of risk takers and entrepreneurs and people that literally pushed 
West is part of what still remains today in that highly individualized view of how you build a society, a family structure unit at its core, is um, is what is unique in part to American culture. Mm-hmm. Let's go back to Scalia. Yeah, I love that moment. I know what you're talking about. Um, he's testifying before Congress, and 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 first of all. And I think you do understand this as well. You acknowledge this because you use the terms positive and negatives. There's no comparison. I mean, Scalia may have been tongue-in-cheek saying these things. There's no way he ever thought that the Soviet Constitution or the South African Constitution, which is based on um, – which Ginsburg praised, uh, which is based on positive rights, is superior to a negative rights constitution like the United States. Well, I think for the Meaning, Soviet Union, there were negative – or weren't there like negative rights guaranteed for like gender equality and 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 there were a whole bunch of other like things that we've gotten through Supreme Court decisions I think but yeah yeah you maybe well, no, I think I it was know. mostly what distinguished those constitutions from ours is was the existence of positive rights okay. so in other words you had a right to a home you had a right to leisure you oh, had a right to yeah. a job um, those are positive rights but those are inherently um, anachronistic to negative rights you can't have both because if you have a right to a home somebody else doesn't have a right to their materials or labor they're required to build you the right to a home. So the United States is built on negative rights, um, property being one of those, but freedom of speech, freedom of religion. It's freedoms that are granted by our Constitution's estimation by God that does use the government as a guarantor of those freedoms, but it doesn't provide you things in a positive sense that the Soviet, and there was a couple other models like South Africa, did so. But his point that he's making, Destiny, is, you know, you can run off a wish list, he kind of holds it up, of different rights, and he said, it's a parchment guarantee. It's just on paper, because you didn't actually have that in the Soviet Union. Nobody got those things. But what he was making the argument, and I think my memory is correct, as opposed to what the way you described it, he wasn't making the argument for institutions, in that case, like the Department of Energy, the CIA, the intelligence apparatus, the Department of the Interior, as an enforcer of the Commerce Clause in order to ensure that Americans can actually live under these negative rights. He was making an argument instead about checks and balances in Washington, D.C. that ensures that no power is consolidated. He was talking about two branches of Congress, a judicial, a legislative, and an executive, all ensuring that no man, no group, no administrative state could interfere with the negative rights of Americans. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like these things can run concurrently in a lot of ways. I guess I would have to go back and re-listen exactly. But I think that, um, I mean, the, I mean, inarguably, are, are the federal uh, executive institutions or bodies I'm talking about come from the executive branch? And obviously there's um, a whole conversation to be had about how much power should the executive branch have in terms of things like the FDA, the Department of Energy, and all of that, um, versus how much are they regulated by Congress. Uh, I, I guess the, the point that I just want to focus on, or, or the point that I would really like to emphasize, is even if I take that Scalia was just talking about like the balance of powers in our government, um, which are another thing that I think Republicans aren't always the happiest to uh, have existing at all points in time, although to be fair, the Democrats do as well, um, I, I think that the structure of the United States has been integral, uh, essential in the thriving of America and the successes that we've had, that for as much as American culture might have contributed to things, uh, American culture is largely existing within kind of the, the boundaries or borders that the American system, you know, allows it to. That yeah. The, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But so so my mm-hmm. point is, I agree with Scalia. I think the so he says in there, like, you can make all those promises, but ultimately in the Soviet Union, it was the party that that decided what you got or didn't get or how it ran. And in mm-hmm. America, it's not run by the party. And so this ties into the conversation we're having about Trump. And you bring up rule of law versus my point of the equal application of the law. And you brought up institutions. So the populist right has lost trust in institutions. When I say institutions, I don't mean those separation of powers that Scalia is talking about, the branches of government that ensures no party takes control. But I'm talking about a permanent Washington administrative state that is there. And the bandwidth of differences, by the way, from Republican to Democratic administrations is largely narrow. And I think that's actually why Trump was so hated, because he represented a potential disruption to that narrow bandwidth that the administrative state ensures. Other people call this the deep state, but it definitely exists. No matter who's in office, there is a group of bureaucrats that run almost all those institutions that you love that ensure America is essentially on autopilot. And anybody that interferes, I think anybody that interferes on X with certain types of speech, anybody that interferes with an obstruction of justice charge, or anybody that fears, interferes running for president will be undercut by that permanent Washington. 
Okay, if I could communicate one idea, let's say that I agree with all of that. This would be the only thing that I would beg people to consider. When it comes to ordinary members in government, or when it comes to ordinary citizens, I genuinely believe, and I think you have to believe this. I think if you don't believe this, I think you're un-American, and I think that you have a pathology that has to be dealt with, okay? I genuinely believe that most people are trying to do the right thing. Uh, I think that I think that fundamentally, when you look at the values, and we can talk about the gayest guy from San Francisco with the most ruralist farmer from Nebraska, on the fundamental values, I think most Americans broadly agree. We want to be able to be happy. We want to be able to be healthy. We want to be able to have our families to work, to do our stuff. I think generally most people just want that. And then we fight around the edges on things like a lot of cultural issues or how high should our taxes be. Um, I think that broadly speaking, I feel like most people are trying to do the right thing. I think if you approach it from that point of view, and you look and you see what's going on, the average conservative, not the people at the top, not the people at the court, but the average conservative says our election was stolen, okay? I don't think that that person is thinking, I bet it wasn't stolen, but I'm just gonna say this to cause mayhem and I wanna you know, screw with everything. I think that they genuinely have questions of like, well, I saw videos with boxes coming out or I heard that we weren't allowed to watch the ballot counting. Like I have legitimate questions. Like how is it the fact that somebody can send out an envelope, get one back and we know that that voter is actually the one that filled it out if the ballot and the envelope are separated. I think these are legitimately good questions and they deserve good answers. But the problem is everybody starts from this foundation of they're rigging it, they're lying about it, they're trying to destroy the country. And when you start from that foundation, nothing works. Because if we have any core value as Americans, it's the fact that we are so unbelievably different than each other, but we all manage to live under the same system and governed by the same laws, and we trade and do business with each other and live next to each other, and somehow society seemed to work that way for 250 years, and it is continuing, hopefully, for at least a little bit longer, yeah. So you said something super deep that I'm not prepared um, to answer. I mean, you basically started with the – so, look, I believe, I believe in Americans. I truly do. You did introduce sort of the Hobbesian versus Lockean view of man's essential nature. Is it, is, is it good? Um, and I'm, I don't know, to be honest. I don't know if, if man is essentially good or essentially flawed. But either way, the, that's where culture comes in. I mean, honestly, that's – I know – I think you're an atheist. I'm not sure – that may be what it said on your Wikipedia. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that's where religion comes in, that there are guardrails placed on humanity. In the best cases, those guardrails are placed willingly and voluntarily, culturally, to keep us within virtuous behavior. But um, I think this is going to be a good segue into some other conversations that we left hanging, and that is the vax and, and t- continuing on with the conversation of institutions. I think that Americans— With that inherent goodness that all want something similar, I'm going to grant you that premise for the most part. I don't think most people are represented, by the way, on the Internet, you know, whatever we see on X or wherever else. I don't think that reflects America. Um, I think that people have lost trust in your institutions that you appreciate because those institutions have earned our distrust. So, for example, this is going to bring all these things together to some extent. You spent time early in our conversation praising the vax, okay? Now, the vaccine has its pros, it has its cons, it has its flaws, it has its benefits, it, like anything else, okay? That's the truth. And, and there's a lot of really earned skepticism towards pharmaceutical companies throughout their history on other products that when you apply to this product and the liability protections they've received, you should probably approach things with a level of distrust. You shouldn't come at this with like, rah, rah, America did this really quick. But more than that, Destiny, all of that censorship where we started, that free speech conversation, the way the institutions behaved towards anyone that exhibited that skepticism or earned distrust, only, and we could apply this to voting as well and, and election you know, denial or skepticism, when you behave that way – and by the way, I think this would appeal to you. Like Here you are talking to me. You're debating – which shows an inherent level of confidence in what you believe, right? Or your ability to go back and forth with me. If you didn't come on, I think that would be a sign of insecurity. I think it is a sign of insecurity for people not to interact with people that disagree with them. So when our institutions go, shut up, shut up, you're censored, you're out, you're a conspiracy theorist, on all of these issues, elections or vaccine or whatever, it compounds the distrust, making Americans not crazy, but actually sane in reading the tea leaves of what's going on in America. I agree with you. I think it's a really bad, or it was really bad, the way that things were handled during the pandemic, especially with all the companies deciding to follow suit, where they're like, hey, well, 
Um, we're going to go ahead and just start shutting all this speech down. We don't want challenges to the vaccine. We don't want challenges to any of the COVID narratives. Um, we're just going to have like basically the government story and everything else is getting banned and shut down. I think that was a huge mistake. However, I can understand an ordinary person uh, having trouble sorting through the statements and sorting through the seemingly contrary positions at times of the CDC, of Fauci, the NIH, of anything else. But I think that our job in the media is to sort through these opinions and find out, well, why are they saying what they're saying? And then it goes back to what I said before, to where are they doing this because they're evil and they're trying to mislead us? Or is it genuinely people who are trying to figure out like, well, what is the correct thing to say or do to maximize essentially the outcomes of the country, you know? Um, without, I'm trying to avoid super prickly issues, but I mean, when COVID came about, nobody knew what that was gonna look like by the end of it. This was unprecedented. It was a massive worldwide pandemic. We hadn't dealt with something of this nature before. It was the, like the most transmitted virus, I think through all of human history in an incredibly short period of time. And you look at like the little island nation of Samoa, I was just reading about this the other day, that uh, I guess RFK made a trip there, was speaking to people that were, uh, I'll be nice to say vaccine skeptic there. And I think in the, in the months after he left, there was like an outbreak of measles where like 83 people died. And people blame, well, you know, before the government had made mistakes relating to how they communicated vaccines, or I think they vaccinated some kids and they accidentally mixed, mixed a muscle relaxant in with some of the vaccines so some kids died. And instead of people thinking like, wow, um, the government is messing up. We should be skeptical, which, by the way, as Americans, we are always government skeptical and we should be. But instead of being skeptical, people immediately said, oh, we're not going to be skeptical. We just know that they're evil. And one of the truly tragic so, things is for the vaccine stuff, when you look at the United States and what happened, I think there's a lot of really good conversation to be had about what should a lockdown look like? What should a vaccine mandate look like? But we don't have that conversation out. Now it's just, well, how much money was Fauci making when he was shoving the evil vax down our throats? Or, you know, how evil are Republicans when they just want everybody to die because they don't care about anybody in the country? And that's like where the conversation starts and stops. Yeah, go ahead. By the way, the mandate mandates a whole nother level to this conversation. Mm -hmm. By the way. Did you say I don't want to go into prickly topics because you were concerned about Fox? Or oh no, I, I bring I up. Think, I try to ground everything I say in it as, as an example so that it doesn't seem like we're just randomly think, but uh, we're just randomly talking. But if I keep bringing up examples that we disagree with, then I understand I'm getting you further and further away from the point. So yeah, I'm trying to find agreeable. No, you know, what I thought you were saying, mm -hmm. and I think you would be accurate to do this, is you want to be careful of prickly topics because this conversation right here might get censored, which I think goes to illustrate my point. Even like broaching this topic as we stream on Facebook or YouTube. Um, it, 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 we run the risk of it being flagged in some way, which is exactly the kind of conversation that we should be having, which, again, distrust breeds distrust. And I don't know, we, could, I wanna, we only have a little bit more time together, I think, but um, I have some curiosities yeah. I want to pursue with you, okay? Uh, wait, so you have in the past described yourself as a libertarian and other times a social democrat. What, yeah. what is your... What is your political philosophy? Um, I, I would say I'm probably social democrat, far left or center left, or if I'm arguing with people farther left than me, I'm a Nazi, I guess. It just depends on who I'm talking to. But uh, I'm a strong <laughs> proponent of capitalism. I think markets are real. They need to be respected. Uh, I'm a big believer in the welfare state. I think that we need to do things to help people at the bottom, uh, You know, have opportunities to climb to the top. Any child that's smart enough to be educated well and go to a good college should never have a financial barrier. People shouldn't be homeless. That's insane to me in this country. Um, but also there needs to be room for you know private entrepreneurs, for people like Elon Musk, for people like Jeff Bezos to thrive and to succeed. Uh, so yeah, I'm a big believer in capitalism, but I think that we should use a lot of those wins that American economy, the American economy generates in order to help the people at the bottom so that they can continue to succeed and be educated and contribute as well. So I'm going to read you a comment that you posted on Twitter. Um, <laughs> uh -oh. You didn't okay. make a rebuttal. You didn't make a rebuttal. It was actually somebody commenting about you, and you just said they they, they characterized me like an anime uh, villain. And this is somebody that posted on, on one of your feeds. Mm -hmm. In the first eight minutes, Destiny said one of the few things that is truly relevant to understanding him. He believes in nothing, nothing besides what is more or less mainstream consensus thought, and that, he, that is how he has longevity. He twirls in the wind, dances on the wires, of course, of discourse. There is no destiny there, but some kind of abstraction. Listen... Okay, you, that's going to be hard for you not to take as ad hominem, but I don't know you, mm -hmm. so I don't know you, so I don't know if this describes you well or not, but I would say this, Destiny, I think this describes a lot of the modern left. I don't know what philosophically or principally ties the left in a coherent vision. It does feel very of the moment, so much so that Barack Obama probably would have been dismissed as a... As a, as a Nazi, because of his positions on gay marriage or whatever you would choose, um, that it is 
progressivism by its very nature is like what's next and yesterday is evil. And it makes it feel what like, well, whatever's popular, whatever's blowing in the wind, whatever's mainstream is what's good. And I think in a lot of ways we look at it and go, that's how you end up in a place where you can't define what a man or a woman is. I mean, if we look at, if we were to play like a logic game, like do like an IQ test, we were to say, okay, what's more similar? On the top line, we've got Bill Clinton, Barack Obama, and then we have uh, Joe Biden. And then on the bottom, we've got, you know, Bush, Bush, and Donald Trump. Who has changed more over the past like three presidents of their party? I, I think mm, that the, I think more that. Tr- is- I think that Trump is, represents More's a tough, significant actually. departure from Biden was literally uh, Obama's VP, right? I think Trump Trump represents a significant well, departure. Matter. Well, sure, but I'm just saying in terms of like shared ideological foundation for lawmakers. I think that Biden is way more similar to the line of Democratic candidates or presidents than than Trump is to any of them. And there are a lot of things that the Trump does now that I didn't know Republicans would ever stand for. My mom is very traditional. Oh, I agree. Yeah, listening to her talk about Bill Clinton and Monica I, Lewinsky and then listening to her defend Trump's comments, I'm like, man, really, Mom? You're okay with that? Or him attacking prisoners of war or POWs like McCain, or like the military. I never knew Republicans would stand for that. I feel like Trump has done some stuff that's like – if you were to talk about like different ideas coming and going and what, what, whatever's popular, um, I feel like Trump represents that more than Biden right now. But see, I, I agree there's been change. I like the, the pivots that Trump represents on Republicanism, meaning I, I like that there's a more of attention to the working middle class. I like that there's some trade protectionism baked in. I like that there's a more dovish attitude toward war um, across the world. Meanwhile, Bill Clinton... There ain't no way he could be a Democrat. I don't care what he says today. The Bill Clinton of 1990s, there's no way he could be a Democrat in 2024. I mean, probably, but I mean, literally every part of the old Republican institution has been completely thrown out, right? Uh, You know, McCain and his daughter, all Mm -hmm. of the traditional Republicans that don't fall in line with Trump, like every single part of the old Republican establishment. I mean, look at the majority speaker positions in the House where where the Republicans lost their majority speaker seat for almost a month. Um, The Republican Party is tearing itself apart right now trying to figure out, like, are we Republicans and conservatives? Are we just like people that follow Donald Trump literally wherever he goes? Um, I think that I think the Republican Party is having a much bigger crisis of identity right now than the, the Democratic Party is. I think that online it's weird because the left is very loud online and they seem like very crazy and extreme. But when you look at the actual lawmakers in Congress, it's more or less like it's farther left than it was, but it's kind of stock Democrat stuff. Like it's a pretty easy continuation of Obama stuff, but the Republicans, whew. Okay, I want to ask you Mm -hmm. um, finally, I want to ask you about your personal life. I think you talk about your personal life, right? (laughs) I Um, do, yeah. Certainly. A lot of people do, yeah. So tell me if I have it right. Bisexual? Open marriage, but now divorced uh, from the relationship that was an open marriage. Accurate? Yep. Um, okay. Do, do open marriages work? Uh, some of them probably do. Some of them probably don't. I've been in a lot of relationships. That probably is carrying a lot of weight. That probably is carrying a lot of weight. <laughs> I mean, it might be, but the 50% divorce rate in the United States today among ordinary heterosexual, ordinary marriage couples is also carrying a lot of weight. I will say also for my— Is um, it 50 still? I think it. I don't know if it's fifty that's, still. Well, I keep saying it. I haven't been corrected on it yet, so I'm going to keep going with fifty until somebody <laughs> says that I'm wrong. <laughs> um, for my for my ex, I loved her very much. We um, she was Swedish and I was American, so the only way she could live with me is if we got married. It wasn't as though like we went into the you know church and we were like, listen, I love you forever. We're going to be together forever. It was more like you literally can't even visit me unless we get married. So um, we loved each other, and I mean, you guys are the federal government. That's enough for getting married. So. That was that. But then, I mean, obviously the marriage didn't work, but I mean, I've had a lot of ordinary heterosexual straight. Did it not work because of because it was open? Um, No, I think it didn't work because I don't know how much you do media stuff, but my life is just my life is insane. I have a lot of crazy stuff that goes on and I'm working constantly. Like I just flew into New York City today to do your show. I'm doing two more and then I fly back tonight and then I'm back to work. And yeah, I think my life is just very incompatible with any type of any type of ordinary human relationship, (laughs) everything at all. Yeah. I mean, the re- it's it's a joke. I mean, it's literally, I think, a, a comedian's joke. You know, like everybody like says, "Oh yeah, open marriage," but in the end, human beings are human beings, and and jealousy is is a constant. I just, I mean, I understand what you're saying, but I, I mean, don't like, know man, how- right now, what's one of the biggest fights going on in terms of marriage is a guy that wrote an article 
about how happy he was that he was traditional. He was a virgin until his marriage, uh, until his marital night. That he waited and dated one girl and did everything correctly. And he wrote that article on, posted on the Fox News website, I think, 11 years ago. And now Stephen Crowder and his wife are uh, embroiled in one of the most brutal back and forth battles <laughs> for custody of their children and for division of assets that the entire internet is witnessing right now. And that was like a marriage that was totally by the books. But nobody will attack that marriage and go, well, you know, just because it was closed, these are the issues. So I understand that people disagree with my lifestyle choices. And you know what? That's great. And I'm glad they do. And they can even voice it because it's America. But it's also America so we could live our lives and do our different things. And uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. We touched on this. Do, do you, I said it, I didn't hear your response. Do you yeah. think the family is the, the functional, foundational element of society? Um, I, yeah, I, I would be hard pressed to think of something that is more fundamental than that, other than the individual, I guess. But yeah, families are probably the cornerstone. They, it's what gives us a desire to do anything for the future, right? Is for what we pass out to our children. Um, it's what gives us a desire to structure our neighborhoods and our societies the way they are, you know, around educating our children, keeping them safe and everything. So yeah, I would, I would say so, yeah. And I mean, if that's the case then, and I'm not looking to debate you personally and your uh -huh. choices on whatever, but like, if that's the case, then all these, you know, approaches to open marriage or whatever, don't they disrupt that fundamental foundational element that builds society? Um, I mean, I, I think that it's important to understand why families are good for children and then to make sure that if you're having a child and everything is working well, that those elements are respected. Um, so for instance, my ex and I might have had, you know, like an adventurous life in terms of what we did together or, you know, within our relationship or outside of our relationship. But I mean, if we would have had children, obviously the structure of that would have changed pretty significantly. Um, you know, we're not, there's not going to be crazy stuff happening in the home when we've got kids present. There, you know, life is going to change accordingly as it always does when you have a child or two or three. All right. So listen, man, um, first of all, I know you said you're going to do two other shows while you're in New York. I, New York. I appreciate you flying up um, and going into Fox to do this. I appreciate the interaction, the back and forth. This was not um, necessarily the most um, pointed debate um, where I know we would have vigorous disagreement on things. Mm -hmm. But if there's ever anything like that in the future, you're welcome to come here on the Will Cain Show and we can have a, um, a pointed debate on specific issues as they come up. And they will come up. And you're welcome here. And I appreciate you coming on Destiny. Cool. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And yeah, I hope that everybody just remembers like there's really awesome, cool things that happen in this country that can only happen in this country. That's true today. It was true 10 years ago. It'll be true hopefully in the future. And yeah, we should focus more on like those positive things and kind of work towards building them and critiquing them rather than, yeah, just throwing everything out and saying it's all broken and we have to start over again. Look at you. You're trying to avoid falling into your own trap. I'm, I'm trying my best. Yeah. Thanks creation is yeah. much, <laughs> creation is much more fun than destruction yeah. and harder, but all right, Destiny, thanks so much for being on the Will Cain Show. Thanks for having me.